Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sebastian Sivio, and I try to talk today about the private FUTEX thing we did this year, last year, about the patches we sent and the things we did in the past and what we tried to optimize. Um, we started. Um, the FUTEX code started initially with Rusty Russell in the early 2.5 series. Back then, we did not have any kind of mechanism to suspend a process and wake it up later. So what Rusty did, he introduced Futex up and Futex down. And this was kind of modeled after what the semaphore did in userland and what was designed in Unix. So you did down and up w for what kind of um, locking mechanism. And a few weeks later, he renamed it to wait and wake, which was mostly what it did. And the basic concept was to be really fast. So you tried to acquire the lock in userland. And if you succeeded, you never went to the kernel in the first place. But if it failed because the lock was contended, you need to go to the kernel to, to sleep and not busy pull for, for, for some time. So then you went to the kernel. The kernel queued your state. And after the lock holder, released the lock, the kernel woke up the process that was stuck in, in down. This is um, the userland part that Rusty released along with the Futex code. So as you see, you had that underscore down method with the counter, which is the only thing that was passed to the kernel the f during the operation. And if it succeeded, you returned with a zero and everything was done. And if you failed, the, the Futex operation was the thing where you called in a kernel. And that was it. It's like a very thin, thin layer which did all the work. And after that, the code evolved. Like a few months later, uh, Rusty came along with async FD, which was similar to what he did with up and down but was based on, on signal handling. So you could do poll and, and all those uh, signal poll uh, things, which were not that perfect. It, they were racy all over the place. And later in January, it was completely removed from the kernel. So if you go back to the history of the 2.6 kernel, you see it being removed. Just for the reason it's being too racy, it couldn't be used. And that's pretty much the history of Furex code um, all over the place. Like we introduced um, Furex VQ, which was um, a glibc requirement. They had these um, conditional variables where they tried to give one lock and had an inner lock, which they need to um, lock one and then take the other lock to check the state and see which, which one is um, the new owner after the wake up. And the Futex VQ thing worked well. But if you had many, many, many waiters, then it was possible that by the time you looked at it, some, another waiter came in and changed the state. And like four CPU nodes back then, like 2004, 2003, it was possible the system locked up because it was racy. So later they came up with the compare VQ. And the first opcode isn't used at all. Just because it was racy. And later we got Futex wake up, which was another optimization to glibc code. And later we got PI Futexes, which are the priority um, inheritance version, where you have a process with a higher priority. And if that process is going for a log, then it boosts all other processes out of the way um, so it can acquire the log really, really, really fast. And after we had that, there was another guy coming because he wanted that Rick thingy for PI as well. And he didn't think it through because um, in June 2007, it was removed again because it was buggy, racy, and didn't work perfectly on um, if you scale it large. Um, around 2007, we got the private view text. Private means it can be only used within a process. So if you have five threads, all five threads can use the same lock. But you cannot share it within uh, two processes, which is fine if that is the use case. And 
from locking within the kernel, it's, it scales way better because you don't have to take the, the MMSEM, for instance, which um, locks the global memory uh, within a process. And yeah, that's pretty much it. What I left out are like thousands of patches in between which were fixing things which were obvious by the time the patch uh, was merged in the kernel, but no, no one seen, uh, has seen it in the first place. So we had bugs all over the place. And if you look back, we have the two operations where you have sleep and, and wake, and it was so simple, but in the long term, it's, it's not. So that's basically the, the, the basic way how Futex work in user land. Um, since we try to do the atomic operation, usually like um, zero one transition, you need some um, assembly code to make that work. So we have had back then, be, like Rusty released his Futex uh, layer, an implementation for x86 and PowerPC. And each one architecture that wants to use Futexes needs to implement this assembly code. And the concept remains the same if you do um, the wake, the requeue, or whatever. If you manage to do it in userland because nobody else is using the lock, you remain in userland. But if it's contended, you need to visit the kernel. And that's the first thing the kernel learns about the lock. So you don't do any kind of initialization of the lock um, beforehand. Um, and that's kind of problematic within the kernel because you never know if the lock the user is pointing you to is valid, if he's the rightful owner or not. Technically, he can take memory, write whatever he wants in it, and say, I want that lock that process X is owning. And that process might not be involved in this locking scenario at all. Um, to get it managed, Rusty got um, a global hash table, which was shared along all lock users. And this is what is called um, a Futex hash bucket. This was what Rusty invented. And each process that is going to wait has a Futex queue which he allocates usually on the stack. For PI, it's slightly different, but mostly it's the same thing. And the Futex hash bucket has um, a, a lock which is held while a process is queued on the hash bucket uh, during wait states and unqueued again during the wake up process. And since it's a hash operation, you can have multiple processes which share the same hash bucket due to um, this, the hash function, but they are not related. So the problem we get here is on the one hand that um, two different processes can um, lock each other out during lock acquirement in kernel, um, and they are not related, so it's not well, it, it's, it doesn't scale well on, on those kind of use cases. And if you go for NUMA, uh, for the big boxes we have today, you have the problem that um, the memory can be, for the global hash, uh, hash list, can be allocated on NUMA node 0, while uh, NUMA node 3 is trying to acquire that memory to perform the, the log operation. So, um, since we have the global... Um, the global hash lock in the, in the hash bucket, um, we see on RT what we call a ping pong boost. Um, what you see here is um, a sketch tracer, which where I remove all those things are not that important to get it fit on the slide here. So on the left, you see met high low is the name of the process. Sketch wake up switch is the name of the event. And what you see here on the second line, you have mat slash 29, which means it's the process name mat and the priority is 29. And it's the curl way of writing things down, which means the lower number is the higher priority. So you see here the mat process is waking up high, and high wants to get a log which is owned by the low process. So what he does is um, he boosts the process from 120 to 9 in order to acquire the lock. So low is on the CPU, it grabs the lock, uh, it has the lock, it does whatever it needs and releases the lock immediately. 
And at that time, it is in the kernel and it's deboost itself after it's um, released the log. But it still holds the, the hash bucket log, which it needs to hold in order to, uh, to enqueue itself from the list. So we switch from low to high, and high is then within the kernel and is going for the hash bucket log. And then we have the same thing again. It boosts low again um, in order to acquire the hash bucket log. And then after it accomplished it, we, boost, we switch back again from low to high. And after this is completed, high terminates itself. So this is um, the middle thing is like the useless uh, ping pong boost we would like to uh, avoid. So we see this problem on RT um, in such a trace, but we don't see this in, in non-RT. But it happens there as well. So what happens on non-RT kernels on SMP is that you have um, the process that has been woken up is pinning on the hash bucket lock uh, the whole time while it's blocked and is waiting for the other part to release it. It's not that visible in tracing, but it's happening. So um, from the RT side, we identified, we fixed it, and we sent patches upstream. And Peter looked at it and said, hey, while this looks good in general, we have other places in kernel suffering from the same issue. And he came along with something he called wake queue, logless wake queues, where each task could be enqueued on the wake queue. And then we could have multiple tasks on the wake queue and release them immediately. And David Law converted after that the Futex wake operation, which was one of the users. And we got IPC MQ in for two converted as well. So those two were also suffering from the same issue while being completely unrelated to our use case. And later I got around and fixed uh, Futex IQ PI, which was actually the key function we needed in RT for our PI things. And as of today, we got uh, IPC MSG merged, and I have the patch posted and merged has uh, performance numbers. And you see we got something like 10, 15% on a slower AMD box, um, which improved things um, after the lockless wake wakes. And to follow the spirit of, of breaking Futex while sending patches, I, the Futex Unlock PI broke RT due to the early deboost. It, I didn't notice it in early testing. It was from, I don't know, when did we, from 4.2 RT, which was merged back in 4.1. And it was just fixed recently, like two weeks ago. And it, after looking at the code, it was obvious, but by the time doing, uh, no one noticed. Um, after fixing it on RT, this is what you see. And this is what you have seen in the first place if it was done right. So you see the mat task is waking up the high ones. The high ones goes for the lock and boosts the low, process, uh, the, the low priority process. And after low switches away, the high process can get on the CPU and exit immediately because there are no more locks to, that are required to complete um, the, the lock requirement. So, after that, we came along to the global hash uh, bucket problem. The global hash problem was or is the same thing we used back then in 2006 when Rusty first implemented it. We switched from hash long to jhash2 for the hashing algorithm itself because it was um, it spread it nicer. But uh, the ground rules we had there and have now are the same. So we have the the amounts of hash buckets are allocated globally based on the number of CPUs uh, at boot time. And as I said before, two tasks can, uh, can share the same, uh, the same log. And it's not always the same two tasks because due to um, memory randomization, the, the hash of the address uh, can differ. And so we can have once this log and then the other one. And it's not always obvious which processes are sharing the logs. Um, and additionally, we managed to trigger an unbound priority inversions on RT. And the problem is that uh, you can have one task which runs on one CPU at um, high priority, and you have another task which is runs on CPU B, but 
could run on any other CPU. And if A is the highest priority task, which is holding, which A, A holds the lock and gets preempted by another task on CPU zero, and B wants the lock, then it gets, preempt, uh, gets, gets preempted and it locks and waits on the lock and it cannot boost the A task because A is um, blocked by another one which has higher pre, uh, priori uh, priority and B is not high enough from the hierarchy of priorities. So what remains is that task C with a uh, much lower priority gets on the CPU and runs and this is not what we want. So after we identify it, we were thinking what can be done and we come which the most more or less obvious thing, where you want um, a unique um, hash bucket struct for each locker in which comes from userland, which is more or less challenging because you never know when the user gets in and where do we have the luck. So it's hard to allocate memory and all you need up front. And then we came up with version one where we said, okay, we need um, additional function in glibc, which we expose via the um, futex um, syscall. Um, we call it futex attach, and this is where we allocate an extra hash bucket for this log you want. And we add, we had also um, another flag like. Um, you have this private flag to distinguish the private futex from the shared futex. We had another flag which you called it's, um, the attached futex. So we could distinguish um, is this futex attached or is this futex used in the, in the global hash array. Um, we started small with like a small hash array and this thing was per thread. So each thread has to attach itself to the lock. Each, um, after it was created, which after the review came out, it was kind of challenging for people, so they didn't like it. But from the implementation point of view, it was pure simple because you didn't have to do any kind of locking for the, um, for the hash array, for the resizing or whatever, because the task itself, the thread, could be either in user land or in kernel, so there was no need for locking at all. And the result was that people didn't like it at all. Mostly because we changed the ABI and the user of, of the pthread mutex had to distinguish, am I special to use this attach, not attached thing, or is not required? And we tried to explain when it's needed, when not, but what it came down that neither Linus nor the glibc folks agreed on it. And another thing is that we had changes in kernel and we required changes in glibc. And from that point, when you f want to get users to use it, it's, it's hard because they need to backport the kernel and they need to backport the glibc. And the glibc part where you have to backport and replace it, it's, it seems tough. So what we learned is that what is expected from us is what we did in the past, that things work out of the box, out of the box automatically. And back then with the attach, we considered the shared futex, which was shared along all processes and the private part. And it came down with the talk with people that um, the shared futexes aren't an issue at all because they are slow in the first place. So there's no need to optimize them further. So we try to stick only with the, with the private futex, which is used within the process and shared among threads. And the part where we have to attach them in each thread, but also considered not very user-friendly, so we dropped it part as well. What we came out with is the version two. And if you look at the email thread, nobody cared about the other patches, they only looked about the first patch where we come up with the algorithm for hashing. Now, the kernel had um, what is called hash long, which is close to the thing we implemented in version two. And we didn't go for hash long, even because even if we were pointed out by Peters and Ada, 
because hash long didn't scale well back then. And this is um, how we tested it for why we didn't choose it. We had um, a larger box, and we did the perf bench um, fudex op operation for wake-ups. What the function does is it um, invokes fudex wake operation in a loop all over the place. And what fudex wake does is usually it wakes up the process, but because you, we specify an invalid um, process for the wake-up, it never does any wake-ups at all. What it does is simply a lookup of the hash bucket and return with an error. And this is actually what we wanted to have. We wanted to see what time do we need, how long does it take for a given implementation to, um, to find the correct hash bucket and do the wake-up. Um, the end option we have, it was something we patch in. So we can limit um, the process to a given NUMA node. So we run all of so we run threads only on that NUMA node, and we can have um, what we had was four NUMA nodes in parallel um, for testing. And while we started it, this is perf top. So we started the benchmark on, on one CPU, and then we started perf top, and we were looking how are things progressing? What is where we stuck? So 23% was perf in the worker FN. A worker FN is the, the thread that is doing the, the Futex wake opcode operation all over, all over, all over, and again. So while we were looking at this, it was 23%. It was like, mm, okay. Uh, in comparison, there was the Futex wait setup, which was something we didn't change at all. And there was the Swiss code at 433%. So it looked like, OK, this is how it has to be. But then we got, like, why is it? What is it doing in the worker function? So we went in perf, clicked on the worker function, and this is what we have seen. Uh, and this is th the loop. At the beginning, it, um, it checks how many Futex this operation it did so far. Then it, the 93% is which came up to the top and was like, ooh, that's a lot. And we don't see anything else. And this is where we got curious. Why is this add operation like at the top? And then we were going further in Perf to look, what is it doing here? And this is a struggling question. This is um, what it did. Um, the Futex pointer is um, the huge array of logs. It, each thread is using, in, it goes in an array like from first, second, and another one. And this is shared among all threads. And the op, the ops thing at the bottom, this is what it increments um, after each, each iteration of the loop. And once perf completes, it said, I was able to achieve like one million operations a second. So that's what the ops is there. Now, anyone has an idea what is wrong here? Well, it's actually simple if you look at it and the, the struct was shared among all threads. So we had a cache ping pong doing, doing the ops incrementation. And this is what killed us. So, after we fixed the tools we use, we went back to step one. So, and this is how it looked the second time. And you see, the worker is, isn't there anymore. It's, it's not an issue anymore. So, step two was, um, okay, what's now a key of interest? So, hash futex at the bottom is the thing we modified because we, um, we had jhash, and jhash was, well, it's, it's long, but it's still fast for what it's doing, but hash long is like three parameters. And for the shared futex and the thing it does in general, in kernel in general, it's okay because you have the mm, and you have the, the offset, and another offset which is like page base. So we have, you have three things that you, put into the hash, but we have only one thing. We have only uh, the user space address. And this is um, not 
the general use case for, for Jhash. This is, um, this is bad. So what we went for is um, hash long, but hash long didn't distribute it uh, well enough along, among all the slots we had. So that's why we get, went back to um, modulo prime number, which um, was scaling very, very well. And modulo hash prime is unfortunately a division. And the division operation was um, popping out, like 7%. And then we were looking at it and was like, hmm, expensive. And the ARM people know very well that division is very expensive on, on CPUs. So instead of doing the mod prime we did in the code, we tried to optimize it further. And what we did is um, multiplication, like inverse one. So we since uh, the, the mod operation is um, the, rem the reminder of the division, we had to do two multiplications to get the same thing, but with multiplication instead of division. And now, with this change, the hash futex went down to 2% only instead of 5. And then we were curious again and look into the hash function, what is it doing? And the bottom line is the two multiplications we have in here are still way cheaper than the one division operation we had in the first place. And GCC, as smart as it is, if you tell them do division or, or the mod operation with a constant number, it will replace it with inversion multiplication uh, all by its own. But since um, we didn't have a constant but um, a number, which were acquired from a struct, it had to do the division. So doing the multiplication on our own was faster, and this is actually why we came up in the first place with our own um, hash function. What happened after that was um, we fixed hash long, um, the reason why it was um, so slow. No, why it didn't spread so well. So for version three, we used again hash long, which was fixed by then. And we dropped some things, but it was mostly the same thing which we had in version two. So we had again a pair process operation to pre-allocate the hash for the task. And this was only done for the RT thing. So we could have larger pools for RT and for people that cared, but everyone else could use the, the small hash table which was um, scaling well. Um, we had to do um, some locking and we dropped the, the rehashing of the thing, of the hash table. Um, the locking was pretty bad because we needed it in several places. And after we dropped the rehashing of the, of the per process table, it was most of the bad things were gone. And there were two things which were not that nice. Number one was that we could um, run out of memory if um, for the first time the, the, the user got into the kernel because it never did a pre-allocation. So we had to allocate the memory back then. And if we, were, if we run out of memory, we moved that futex to the global um, hash futex, the hash bucket table again. So you would run into the same problems you before our modifications, but you wouldn't know it because nobody wanted to change the glibc. And to make it worse, we could have hash collision, but now pro uh, um, process-wide. Not system-wide, but process-wide, and this is uh, what killed us. Okay, so we tried again. And so, but now we were like, okay, GDPs interaction, maybe we can do something about it. But the part where we have to um, have to be collision free and when not allowed to allocate memory is, is, is tough. And we we're looking at different algorithms uh, for hashing and what others do in similar situations and we didn't come across anything that would help us at all. Um, there were hash algorithms which were guaranteed hash free, but what they did is they hash and get to a certain spot. And if that spot is taken, they take uh, the next slot and the next until they find an empty one. And this will work for us, except that um, 
we could remove peop um, hash buckets if they, if they are gone, and then we wouldn't find them again because we didn't skip the empty ones. And this is just one example of few we were looking into and which uh, did not help us. So, um, there is, this is an idea we came around, which was pretty, one of the first ones we had before we posted version one. But we dropped it because it was too hard to use. Back then in version one, we had all operation per thread. And we had IDs per thread. And this was something, um, it was not usable at all in user land. Um, because we did not have a per thread memory. So, um, so we came along with those IDs um, process-wide. So the first user doing a pure thread mutex init function does an attach, and he, he receives a cookie. And after that, each every operation that follows, like pure thread mutex lock, unlock, uh, requeue, is not using the URL, but uh, the cookie instead. And the cookie is simply an index in, in our array in kernel. So we have like O1 access to the, to the hash bucket we want. And this is like slightly major change in the glibc. But we could hide it so there would be no, no things the user has to change in his uh, program. We could hide it in pure thread mutex in it, the attached part. And there is another part for the, uh, for the cleanup of the Futex. But the, the pfred mutex init man page says that this operation cannot fail. But since we call the kernel for memory allocation, we can fail. So it's problematic again. Because if we fail, then and do some fix up that we go to for the global hash bucket again, then the user is not knowing that it's now working different. There's no way of telling. And the part where we have to replace the log with the ID is also problematic because um, the pthread struct from the glibc is uh, ABI and it's fixed size. So it's kind of tough to, to hide the ID somewhere within the, the struct without modifying it. And to make all those things worse, um, there is fork. And on fork, we have to copy all IDs it's because um, the logs might need to work after the fork. It's when usually what people do after fork is that they exec another process. We have vfork for it, but most people are not aware of it. So the, the bad part is that we make fork uh, slower and for no, for no good reason. OK, so we came along with um, idea two, which was, I have to say, a weak moment of myself. So the idea was um, each thread is usually in, in user space or in the kernel, but it's nowhere in between. And requeue is the only function that requires two hash buckets. So the idea was that each uh, process on fork uh, comes along with two hash buckets and puts in the global pool. And each time we get in the kernel on the log operation, we go to the pool and, and take something out and use it for this operation. And once we're done, we get it back to the pool. And the problem is that, is that we need a global log. And this is not scaling well at all. And I tried to optimize um, the link list for the lookup with the RB tree, but it's the link list wasn't a problem in the first place. The problem was um, the global log, which has to be shared among all threads for the lookup. And then we tried again the third one, where we do the attached thing again, but the URL mapping with the um, with the hash bucket is not done with the ID, but with um, RB tree walk. And the whole thing is RCU protected, so we don't have any logs in the hot path. And this is um, nice since we don't have the ID, so we don't have to do anything on fork. Um, mm. But we need small, small support on the glibc side for the attached part. 
and we do, cannot do it without glibc modifications, so we do auto-attach, because A, we can run out of memory and we are not allowed to tell glibc about this. And if we do attach but not detach, we can have um, hash buckets which don't belong to a process because the memory where the log was a part of is gone. And to make it worse, uh, people could do like attach on four megabytes of memory and they have allocated one million hash buckets in the kernel. So as perfect as it sounds, it's not that good. So um, these are some performance numbers I gathered with uh, the implementations um, we made. Um, each bar is a number node, uh, is a thread. So you see 64, and this means we have 64 futexes. And on the lower you see T8, which means we have eight threads. And so what it means is we have eight threads doing operation on 64 futexes. And then we have green is number node 0, 1, 2, and 3. And this is how the implementation current scales so far. So we have something about uh, 6 million operations a second. And if we go up to 64 threads and 1,000 Numan, 1,000 um, Futex, we go to like two and a half million operation in. So this is how it scales. Um, this is the the SEU tree lookup. So while it's not that bad, we still have roughly five million operation a second. And if we go to the to the right to the th uh, 36 threads per Numa node, we still have nice 3 million lookups a second. So it's, it's not that bad, but we, the arbitrary goes like um, 16 levels deep, so it's a lot of lookups to do. Um, this is the, the one, the version 2, that got knocked down because we could have hash collisions. And this is slightly slower than the version zero, what we have with the global um, hash table, but we have only 256 uh, uh, hash slots, while the global hash tree has um, 64K. So memory-wise, we use way less of them. But due to the hash collision part, it's not considered. And this is uh, the part where we use the unique IDs. And performance-wise, it's the best thing we have so far. It outnumbers even the, the, the current version we have in kernel. Um, I presented the numbers on the slides yesterday on the RT summit. And the outcome is that we don't really agree what we want to do um, from the kernel side and from the GLEEPC side. So Right now, we try to have another conversation with people and what we can do and how we follow things. Any questions? Anyone? Okay. Thank you.